All right, continuing on with the anthology marathon, we have the classic Tales from the Hood. Not the crypt, not the dark side, not any of that stuff. It's from the hood. No the leprechauns hood. this time. No. <laughs> he didn't goodness. go back to the hood. He's not in the hood. He's nowhere near the hood. He's at nowhere this near point. the hood at this point yes. in time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but this movie is the shit. <laughs> It is the shit. <laughs> yeah, man. I just the dude, the dude who runs the mortuary. I, uh, I love his performance in this so much. He's so over the top and yeah. in all the best ways. And every time he says the shit, and he gets that look in his eye and the like gap in his teeth mm-hmm. and all that. So the way he looks, his hair. Yeah, I love it. I love it. He, I feel like he's one of the more under. Uh, he's one of the more overlooked mm. horror villains. I just, I don't know. There's a presence in him. And I, and I really wish that these two later sequels that were like direct to DVD, uh, cheaper cash in type things to take a pro- known property from the past and just to kind of put out some random, um, you know, inferior stuff. I really wish that Tales from the Hood would have got proper sequels mm. after this and and we would have been able to bring back uh, this actor and and for that character because I think he could have been iconic I, th- I think he could have been you know alongside of some some great um, horror villains mm. right mm-hmm. and uh, I still think he's great and and does this uh, deserves that place. But he only has one film, yeah. and it's an anthology, so he only maybe gets ten minutes all together. Yeah. So it would have been it would have been great. I mean, we get I think Keith David, if I remember correctly, is the guy who does uh, two and three. Uh, I saw two. I don't think I ever saw three. Mm. Uh, maybe we'll watch them. That would be kind of fun to to take on the Tales from the Hood trilogy. <laughs> um, but this is. This is definitely the best one. I haven't even seen the third, but I already know there's no way. Because this this is a film that I think is really interesting because of preconceived notions. Mm. I think when you see the title, right, we get this kind of preconceived notion that something that goes to the hood, right? Sure. Uh, Leprechaun in the hood or whatever. You get this like Tales from the Hood and and you think it's going to be stupid from that title. Mm -hmm. You kind of roll your eyes at it a bit. Mm -hmm. But it's a a really good movie and I think that it actually has a lot of depth to the stories that it's telling. Yeah. Right? It's about systemic racism and it's about uh, generational racism and it it, it deals with a lot of... um, cultural uh, significance and um, oppression and I mean the list goes on and on Uh, it's a good social commentary without being overly preachy although we do live in a time where I feel like if this came out now it would be seen as woke or something but um, man I think it handles its material super well and and is a very cool film so what do you think? Yeah no I agree completely I was I was just like not, I didn't really know what to expect. I kind of, I guess, was expecting like a sillier movie. Um, And it was, there's a lot of like really heavy stuff in here and a lot of actually really scary stuff too. Sure. Um, The last segment or the second to last segment. With what? That has like the actual like um, footage of like the KKK and like lynchings. Like that's so disturbing to see because I even asked you during it. I was like, is that real? Are those like real pictures that they're showing? It has to be. It's so, it's so messed up on so many, so many levels. And um, yeah, I I really liked this movie a lot. I I enjoy seeing, um, I guess like, you know, we've, we've watched some kind of like black horror. Uh, Not, there's, you know, not enough, of course, just like there isn't enough of all other types of representation in horror. Sure. Um, but seeing something like this, like, it's genuinely scary. And I think that, you know, being somebody, you know, who maybe was watching it in the time that it was made, 
probably had a really like it, I can just imagine it being like really relatable and I like I don't know I like like urban legends and like scary stories told from like different cultural groups to oh, see yeah, like yeah. the perspective from that group that like I wouldn't have or somebody else wouldn't have you know and that's what I really appreciate about it but I was I was really into it yeah really into it um I like that the guy brings up a, a, a very good question that I've asked many times, uh, but I did Google it to finally find the answer because I took the time for once uh, after asking the question many times. Why are they called refried beans? Oh, yeah. You're like, I've been saying that for years. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess the re in Spanish is represents something else. Anyways, it, it, uh, it uh, comes out to well-fried beans. Oh, I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah. Well, fried beans. I had to read a whole thing on it. <laughs> I was just to trying the... to find the answer. I was just like, give me the answer. I just want this. Two seconds. <laughs> what does it mean? Why? You don't fry them twice. Yeah. So what is it? But well, just fried well beans. Fried. That's it. Hmm. So moving on from that. <laughs> I just He brings it up in the movie and he's asking that question. And that's the kind of question I love to ask. Like, why is it called refried? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Now we know. Well, fried. Kind of. <laughs> um, yeah. So the wraparound is called Welcome to My Mortuary. I like that these get titles. And mm. they are in the credits, so you don't even have to look anywhere. They're in the credits for you to see. So I do like when when uh, anthologies do list mm. the titles, which I feel like most do. I feel I, like most yeah. do. I like it too, though. I like having the titled segments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and... So they're going to this mortician because he supposedly found drugs in an alley mm -hmm. and he's going to give them the shit yeah. uh, as soon as he takes them through the mortuary and shows them four different corpses with four different stories. Yep. Uh, they sit there and listen to these stories. Um, now, how long he tells these stories and in, in, uh, we know how long, cause this is a pretty short film yeah. with, uh, how many segments and whatnot there are. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's a lot going on in every segment. Yes. And the, and the wraparound. Yeah, compared to like the Willies, which we just reviewed. Sure, which had like two segments. And like two segments, but this has so much happening. And the Willies is the same, about the yeah. same length. Yeah, yeah. This is only 96 minutes. Mm. This is a quick one. You would think this one would be about two hours, but it's only an hour, a little over an hour and a half. It's pretty impressive for how much they get into this movie. Yeah, I think they pace it really well. You know, yeah. everything, nothing feels like rushed or like there's too much or it's confusing or convoluted. Like everything makes total sense for the stories. And, you know, you're like I was engaged through each one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and if you guys didn't notice, I have a VHS of yeah. it because people love the retro VHS shit. I mean, I'd much rather have it on Blu-ray. <laughs> but the VHS is yeah. just... It's cool. It's cool. It gives them the nostalgia. <laughs> but I, I like to see things better. Um, so anyways, we move into our first segment called Rogue Cop Revelation. And mm. we've got racist cops beating this man uh, for taking down corrupt cops. Uh, they find out... Well, at least the rookie cop finds out that he's a politician that mm -hmm. specifically takes out cops. Um, but they must have known that. That's why they go after him. And, the, you know, so it kind of reveals that, but it's more revealed to him. Um, this one, I feel, as well as the next one. And I feel like you could interpret all of these for the most part. Um, yeah, I guess all of them. You could, in, you could interpret them as psychological. Like, the first one is about guilt, mm. right? And these racist cops uh, killed this guy after they beat him badly and then and, and, and pushed the, the rookie cop, who's also uh, black, out. And then he can't let it go. He knows what happened. He can't say anything. So he starts hearing vis uh, voices of the guy who they killed and he's telling them like listen you got to take you know bring him to me i'll take care of him so they bring him over to their graveyard uh the guy starts pissing on his grave to add insult oh, to my injury God. and um then he starts killing them one by one um which you could see if you want to go the psychological route uh he's not the the dead guy's not killing him the cop 
rookie cop is killing them in the name of him out of the guilt of not saying anything when he should have. Yeah. Now, I think there's a message to be taken from all of these for sure, obviously. Um, so I don't think it really matters. Mm. It's really just the message that, that, that's being, um, portrayed here. But, uh, yeah, I, I just thought it was interesting that every one of these, I was like, oh, this, this is guilt. Mm -hmm. This is this, this is that. So, um, we do get a guy who's pulled down through a grave by his dick. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> and, it sucks so bad. He deserves it. <laughs> and then the grave explodes. Yeah. And, uh, I really, I thought it was kind of a missed opportunity. He should have been like perched on the gravestone mm. after he blows up the grave and then they pan up and he's like standing, but he's just standing behind the grave. I think if he was just like up on it, been... like on all fours, oh, that would have been creepy yeah, as hell. That would have been really creepy. I was hoping that that was going to happen. Mm. Um, this guy could teleport. Yes. They like look and he's there, then he's here, then he's there. It's like <laughs> suit, like instantaneously. He's on the back of the car when he was oh, like a, my half a mile away one second ago. So scary. And you thought that... He, the look of him was actually scary. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that visually, like, it was a really, cre like, a creepy design. And especially that scene in particular where he's, like, following them and then getting closer and then they turn around and he's in the back. Like, that was really scary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For sure. Good makeup stuff. Yeah, yes, for really sure. good. Really good. Um, because we also get a really cool scene of one of the cops... He's like stuck to the wall, mm -hmm. and then he starts like coming undone and yeah. and like ripping apart and like forming into the wall, and then eventually becomes part of the painting. It's wild. But the effects on him like exploding all over the wall slowly, and yeah, before he becomes the painting is super cool. Super cool. I think each of these segments has some really unique and interesting visuals. Uh, which is one of the reasons why I think it's uh, such a good movie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's also crucified with heroin needles, mm -hmm. which is another, you know, social commentary as well, mm -hmm. which I thought was really cool. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, Rogue Cop Revelation. Yeah. Uh, second segment, we've got boys do get bruised. And I feel like, I feel like this might be the most recognized segment from this because we've got um david allen greer who's a really funny comedian and is always known as kind of like the like funny silly guy he's not like scary at all mm -hmm. in anything ever and in this he's this like horribly abusive monster literally or figuratively mm -hmm. um but this this is about you know child abuse and, yes. and an abusive father and uh, what some kids go through in their life and this kid's coming to school and a therapist tells him that he can uh, draw his problems and defeat them by getting rid of them um which becomes literal Yes. But uh, the teacher comes over to the house. Now, I feel like it takes way too long for the teachers to be coming to the house. But that's one of the problems, especially in lower income neighborhoods. When kids are being abused, they kind of write it off for too long. Sure. Because they're not their problem. And then once it happens too much, uh, social services or the teachers or whatever do eventually have to take notice. But as, you know, a kid that came to school with some bruises here and there... They don't take it that seriously for a little while, but then eventually they start to, if it starts to become like, um, you know, a, like a psych, pattern. Yeah, pattern. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, it, it takes a little long, but that's fine. Um, it isn't fine at all. It's not fine. <laughs> I just, for the movie, for the I movie. mean, that's yeah. what I mean. Of course it's not fine in real life. I was just like, but that's fine. Let's move on. Um, and, when the teacher finally does come over, because mm -hmm. he, the kid before that, this kid's bullying him and he crumples him. Yes. And the kid like falls down the stairs like in freaking Unbreakable, Samuel Jackson's glass character. And it's like the, the guy's like, 
he just fell down the stairs. How does he break both arms and break uh, both legs? Kid must have weak bones. I was like, is this the, is this the setup for glass? <laughs> um, but yeah, he, he crumples that paper completely. Mm-hmm. That kid should have been broken everywhere. His it back, his ribs, every bone in his body should have yes. been crumpled. Yeah. Just like the yeah. monster in the end. Right. Right. So how he only gets his arms and legs broken doesn't make any sense to me. Maybe he's like not quite at the power level yet to do the full crumpling of I mean, the body. He breaks the arms and the legs. It's just yeah. power only. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. I, I mean, I what other explanations <laughs> do you have? Right. Yeah. I get it for sure. Um, and when the teacher arrives, the mom is like really flirtatious, but I think that's a defense mechanism. That's what I thought. To like push him. I I don't know, but it wouldn't push him away. Right. It would make him want to draw himself in more, but it's like, (sighs) maybe she's just lonely. But then like when she remembers her husband's coming home, she's like, Oh God, you got to get out of here. But she's like really trying to, you know, deflect and distract away mm-hmm. from the problem at hand, the real problem. Yeah. And gets mad at the kid and everything. Because, of course, she doesn't want the attention there because her husband's a monster. Now, whether or not you think of him as figuratively or literally a monster um, remains to be seen. But, uh, yeah. He's both. <laughs> he is both, He's for sure. Both, yeah. He even has a tattoo commemorating what a monster he is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think the mom is flirtatious as a defense mechanism, as you said. I, I mean, even though you would think it would draw him in, I think the idea is, like, if she gets him kind of, like, attracted and into her, like, maybe she could tell him to come back later or whatever, you know, kind mm. of push him in what direction she wanted him to go. Um, but the ending for this segment is, like, really cool. I yeah. love, 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 love. <laughs> oh, my God. It's so awesome. Yeah. Just to see him crumple down and, like... You know, obviously you feel a sense of justice and relief for the kid because he's doesn't, you know, he's dealing with this monster yeah. in a way that I think a lot of people probably wish they could have, you know, when, when they have abusive parents or, or guardians or what have you. When I first saw this kid in this, it's been a while since I seen it and I didn't know for sure or not, but I thought this kid looked so much like Tyler from Child's Play 3. Mm. I actually had to look it up and it isn't. Uh-huh. But he really looked a lot like him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he he folds the freaking paper across his arm and the arm breaks back. But then when it, the leg one, oh. the way he crumples and then he twists him. Yes. The and his twist. body twists around and he flattens him and he's on the ground. He's like, ooh. Oh, man. And then they burn him. Ah, yeah. great stuff. So good. So yeah. cool. So a kid kind of overcoming his villainous um, father or stepfather. Mm-hmm. I can't remember. I think it's his stepfather. I think so. Too. Yeah. Um, all right. So third segment, KKK comeuppance. And this is about a racist politician played by the dentist himself, Cor- uh, Corbin Burdenson. Um, he has a, a um, black campaign manager. Mm-hmm who knows that he's racist and even encourages his racism by telling him what to say and making these horribly racist jokes. Oh my god. And then being like, never mind, don't say that. Like you'll lose the campaign, but finds it funny. It's really weird. And that actor is one of the detectives alongside Daniel Roebuck in Final Destination, Mm. the very first Final Destination. He's the other um detective alongside of Daniel Roebuck who's who's done a ton at this point um, but I always know him from River's Edge but fuck, he's he's done so much especially since uh, he works with Rob Zombie all the time now mm. um, and I, he just recently played uh, Grant uh, in the Munsters which we tried watching oh. about 10 minutes or 15 yeah, minutes of far. and uh, we, we, we gave up we'll try maybe some other time maybe 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 <laughs> Um, but yeah so yeah i mean this one's just a killer doll segment yes which is like this is a much better better version to me of the zuni fetish doll i agree yeah i totally agree yeah they're so scary yeah they're so and they're tiny and they're fast 
like, and the way that the stop motion, like, they, on some of the shots, it looks like there's actual puppets that they have. Sure. Right? So, all of it is super cool with the dolls. They say in here that this guy is a former Ku Klux Klan uh, member <laughs> running for office. Um, and he moved into a, an ex, like a plantation house. Yeah. And has a black cam- campaign manager who is like playing on the fact that he's racist and just taking a paycheck. And he never really shows much remorse or no. like, like shit talking him behind his back. Like, oh, I'm only doing this for the money. This is like. This guy is one of the worst people in the sure. movie, for sure, that he would encourage that and actually, like, play on his side. Yeah, totally. And, like, I, th- I, if he would have just been like, oh, no, I, like, I'm here to make sure he doesn't win. Or just something. Yeah, that at least would have been. But, man, rough. he's just terrible. He's awful. He reminds me of um, Samuel Jackson's character in Django Unchained. Mm-hmm. Like, a black person who's doing it to other black mm-hmm. people and is, like, just horrible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah very horrible for sure. Um, it's, uh... But yeah, anyway. So uh, we also get Barnes in here from Die Hard 2, Die Harder, which is the literal title. Die I know Harder. we haven't watched the Die Hard movies yet, but it was great to see him in here. And of course, he's always yelling. <laughs> um, the dolls that are in the paintings mm-hmm. and the fact that they uh, had possessed by the souls of, of dead slaves that died on the plantation and that they come for this asshole uh, is just freaking awesome. It's so cool. I love it. I, I love that too. they come out little by little. Yes. One here, five here, all of them here. Yeah. Even the even the old grandma oh my gosh, makes yeah. an appearance. But to... the shot where he like sees the painting and all of the dolls are gone and he's just like, that's sure. so good. And then, yeah, the, the lady comes out and is, like, watching in her rocking chair as they eat him. They're biting yeah. him. They're literally, like, chewing on him. He just lays down and takes it, though. He does. He's he just doesn't... like, oh, it's like Gulliver's Travels, except for he's not tied down. <laughs> yeah, he's not he's tied down. He's just like, oh, no. And they just start chomping on him little by little. Yeah, I, think I feel like he could have got out of that, but. He's overwhelmed. I yeah, think. sure. He's scared. I get <laughs> he's it. He's scared, so he's not it. thinking logically. Plus, there's, like, a hundred of them. Yeah. I'm glad he gets eaten alive, though. Um, yeah, she reminded me of Mother Abigail from The Stand. Mm, I have you've never watched The Stand. You've never seen The Stand or read any of it. Stand, oh, yeah. wow, yeah. Um, no. She's, yeah, she's an old black woman who sits mm-hmm. in a rocking chair. Oh, okay, well, then she, there's it, the... It looks, <laughs> I don't know, it looks very similar. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Gave me that feel. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that's that's really it. But it, it's it's great. It's really cool. I love it. Me too. <laughs> yeah, it's a really cool killer, killer doll segment yeah. for sure. Um, and finally, the fourth segment, Hardcore Convert. Um, this is Crazy K. Crazy and Crazy K. K, he goes and he kills somebody in the beginning. And we find out that he's killed many, many people, including children. Mm -hmm. Uh, with stray bullets and uh, doesn't take any ownership of this. He is put in prison after uh, the cops kill the uh, three people who are about to kill him, which we find out in the end that that's not actually what happened because he is just having a vision. Now, what is actually happening in this segment? I don't know. I feel like... He's been he's given an opportunity to save his soul potentially by actually pleading his case of if he's sorry and mm. if he has any remorse or anything. And so he's he's put into this prison program where where he's experimented on and he's shown all those horrendous images of, oh, of black on uh, white on black violence. Then, of course, uh, juxtap- juxtaposed against black on black violence. Yeah. And it's really kind of illustrating that, like, you know, it used to be the white man that was killing black people in, in, in large numbers. And now black people have uh, started killing themselves and each yeah. other yeah. And, and kind of showing, the, you know, how, how much black 
death there is coming from from both parties. Sure. And that was really powerful, I feel. Mm -hmm. Um, And just showing like his reactions to that and then um, being kind of given this moment of of potential clarity Mm -hmm. after being shown all that and being like, you know, uh, shown your, your own shit and then, and then being put into that room and, and, and having to face all the people he's killed. Oh my gosh. Yeah. He doesn't respond well to really any of it. I feel no, he has so much hate in his heart, so much hate. And he's just like, yeah, he doesn't give a shit. I think is the phrase that he kind of starts repeating. He has a moment there for a second when the little girl comes out and he, that's the, the only moment we see of any kind of like remorse yeah or like anything from him but outside of just anger but then he like drops immediately it super he's like that bullet didn't have your name on it or it doesn't sure. have names on it like you were in the wrong place at the wrong time and it's like sure but that little girl would not have gotten killed if you weren't shooting somebody sure like you're a co- you're the cause of it yes you know this isn't like an act of God where like a meteor falls in your house and you get killed that way. No. It's not the same thing. No. Um, I, I do think that the segment, like it, it blends in right. This last segment blends in with the wraparound, obviously. So I do think that he is given like, like you said, a chance to sort of save his soul. And he obviously fails um, because he doesn't respond with any remorse for what he's done at all. Um, but yeah, I think it was a really powerful segment as you said, with all the juxtapositions and just, it was cool. Like just, I don't really know why (laughs) the only part that was confusing was why the women were like the workers in this area that he's sex workers. They really, it was weird. They were like in leather outfits and stuff, but I guess if it was, you know, maybe part of his mind, like a psychological component, that's just what his brain is like projecting around him. Um, which, you know, whatever that might mean. I don't know. I don't yeah, know it's, it's a good question. Um, it also raises the question of like, if so, our mortician here he talks about how everything he tells in his stories is true and real mm-hmm. that it actually happened. And if this happened to that guy, Crazy K, and he got his potential a redemption moment, um to absolve him of something or at least get him on the path um, to being able to save his soul or whatever. These guys, these three guys, are taken through the mortuary in the same scenario. Mm. They're already on their way. But they're dead at this point. So maybe it isn't because Crazy K is still alive and he has a moment before death. Um, what the point of him telling these three guys all these stories to then just reveal that they're dead and in hell, I don't know. But I, I, I kind of took it as, will they change their mm-hmm. wicked ways? Mm-hmm. After he's told them all these stories, they have an opportunity to drop what they're there for, to stop, you know, um, the pursuit of drugs and, and revenge and murder and, um, you know, shutting someone up who might know the truth about you or whatever, like just taking it. And, and I think that they fail time and time again. And in yes. the end, they still pull a gun on him and they're like, give us the shit. And he's like, all right, like now you're in hell. Yeah. And then he reveals, like, you know, I gave you so many chances. I tried to tell you, like, I'm showing you all the problems with this this world you grew up in mm-hmm. and, and how you're a victim of these things. And if you could just see that, that and, yeah. and kind of see what I'm trying to tell you, because all these messages are being lost on them. They're just yes. they're just kind of, you know, tunnel vision about, like, getting drugs and, and doing criminal stuff. Yeah. And in the end, they still pull guns on him. They still threaten his life. And, uh, you know, they they pay for that. They do. They so, do. Yeah, I guess that was their two chances. Crazy, Crazy K got his chance. And then these guys, I think, maybe had their chance to get out of there. 
Yeah, I, I think so too. Because Crazy was... K doesn't know he's dying or about sure, to die until the last, yeah, mm. the last second. Yeah. I yeah, I think so too. I think that there's, I mean, it's definitely a morality tale. Like each of these segments has something to to say, mm-hmm. and I do think that they would have been able to potentially escape, you know, if they had opened their hearts more and opened their minds more to the error of their ways. Sure. But they don't. They don't. So they go to hell. <laughs> they go to hell. And I like <laughs> the depiction of the devil and how Me he turns too. and he's terrifying and yeah. they're just burning. Although, I know, but some when of the they're people, burning, they're like, Ugh, There's like, like, yeah, some people in the front that are just kind of like waving their arms like this. When he was shaking like this. <laughs> It reminded me of in Return of the Living Dead 2 mm. when the Michael Jackson uh-huh. zombie comes in front of the screen and he's like, <laughs> <laughs> that's what he looked like to me. Anyways, um, so that's that. Cool movie. Very I'm cool. sure that will be lectured in the comments below that we're white people and we don't know what we're talking about, um, which is fine. Uh, which is fine Wait. is my is my go to tonight. That is your everything's go-to. fine. It's, like, it's, it's fine. fine. It's fine. It's okay if you abuse your kids. Is, that's not what I was getting at at all. But that's what it sounded like, like for a second. It's fine. They didn't go there soon enough. That's fine. See, you said it. Oh no. Oh, no. All right. Well, subscribe. Oh yeah, subscribe. Like, like check share, out the Patreon. Uh, tell strangers comment, on the street. Tell them. Walk and... up to them. Subscribe to Sinister Cinema Reviews. Pull out your phone. Don't walk away until they're subscribed. Exactly. Actually, I don't want subscribers like that. I want people who actually watch the channel. (laughs) Find other people that that. might like it. Yeah. Like you. Recommend it. Yeah. Piece of shh. Just kidding. (laughs) Bye, guys.